Hey everyone, my name is Paul Vicheski and welcome to the Real Estate Classroom YouTube channel. In this video, we're gonna discuss two concepts you have to know for your exam. Judicial foreclosure and non-judicial foreclosure. We're gonna discuss both and what the differences are. Things you need to know for your real estate exam coming up in this video. So in this video, we're gonna discuss two concepts that uh, basically you have to know, judicial foreclosure and non-judicial foreclosure. And I have your key terms that will be discussed in this video on your screen there. Um, what's the definition of each? Well, a judicial foreclosure is a judicial process that requires the lender, now the lender is the mortgagee, to file suit in court in front of a judge to start the foreclosure process against the borrower who is the mortgagor. Now a non-judicial foreclosure allows a foreclosure to take place because of default to the borrower by what's called power of sale. It's an actual sale that goes on. We call it a trustee sale. And that is conducted by the trustee um, because the borrower known as the trustor, a lot of legal terms here, defaulted on their payments. The difference between the two, judicial foreclosure is an actual judicial process. A suit has to be filed in court and a non-judicial foreclosure, there is no judicial action. There is no suit that's filed. It just directly goes to uh, a, a trustee sale. Now, how do we know which is gonna apply here? If, if, a, if a bank is dealing with a borrower who's defaulted on payments, which one do they do? Well, that's a great question. And it has to do with what type of state it is. And we talked about this in a previous video. We talked about it in the promissory note and, and mortgage video and also the deed of trust video. I'm gonna leave a link in the upper right-hand corner if you wanna check those two out. But um, mortgage states, meaning they use an instrument called a mortgage as collateral for the loan, in those states like Iowa, they would use the judicial foreclosure. In states like Nebraska, where I'm at, we're a deed of trust state. And so a deed of trust state is gonna use a non-judicial foreclosure. So let's go ahead and talk about each specifically. Judicial foreclosure, it's a judicial process that requires the lender, which is the mortgagee, to file suit in court to start the foreclosure process against the borrower who's the mortgagor. Again, if you watch that previous video that I've done on promissory notes and mortgages, it'll help explain this particular part of this video. Now, I've, I've listed eight things that you really need to know about judicial foreclosure. Number one, it's used in mortgage states. Number two, foreclosure can take up to months or years to foreclose. The, the foreclosure process uh, is stri it's strict and it's not quick because I think we all know that anything that goes to court is not a fast process anyways, but there are some mechanisms in place that allow the borrower or the mortgagor to extend the foreclosure process. Number three, Borrow, the borrower, who's the mortgagor, I know I keep killing this dead horse in every video with these terms, but you have to know what they are. It's sort of like teaching kindergarten here. The borrower, who's the mortgagor, they may have a right of redemption. We call that equitable. Uh, we call it a right of redemption or sometimes called an equitable redemption. And so even after foreclosure happens, in some states, that borrower may have three months, six months, or a year to actually redeem the property. Uh, that is state by state and very state specific. It's not something specifically you have to know uh, the time frames for your licensing exam. However, you do need to know it. Uh, know that uh, the borrower may have the right of redemption. Number four, a um, a petition. Uh, which is foreclosure action is going to be filed in court against the debtor, which is the borrower. And this is important. So not only is the borrower going to get served that, um, that petition, so are all the junior lien holders. So maybe it's the mortgage, the first mortgage that's filing the foreclosure action, but maybe there's a second mortgage and then there's a, uh, a mechanics lien 
and those type of things. All the per people or all the entities that have that have um, liens against that property are going to get notice. They're actually going to be called as defendants actually in the lawsuit. Number five, junior lien holders may redeem the senior lien holder or allow the foreclosure to happen and file what's called surplus money action. So the mortgage company that's in first place, they have the right to foreclose. Then we have the second mortgage, for example, in our scenario here. That the second mortgage company has two options. They can pay off the first mortgage and then they're in first place and then they have the right to uh, pursue the foreclosure. Or they can simply allow the first mortgage company to go ahead and foreclose and then they're going to file what's called the surplus money action. They're basically going to say, hey, we're owed money too. And if there's anything left over, we want our share of it. So the junior lien holders have that right to do either one. And a lot of it, quite frankly, has to do with how much equity there is. Um, I can remember back in 2010 and 11 when you know the, the mortgage crisis happened many times the second company just kind of said, we're not going to get any money anyway, so we're not going to mess with it. You know, but if there is equity in the house, it may be something that the second uh, mortgage holder is going to at least look at. Number six, the process, once the courts have determined that it's legitimate and they authorize the foreclosure sale to happen, it's going to go to what's called a sheriff's sale or a sheriff's auction. And it will be an auction, sometimes at the courthouse, sometimes it's at the property, but it's the sheriff's department that actually does it. All right. And then also number seven, remember, there are certain liens against the property that don't go away, even if there's a foreclosure. Tax liens, property tax liens never go away. Uh, IRS tax liens don't go away. Special assessments don't go away. So anybody who shows up to that auction in addition to the lender, um, they may actually, if they buy the property, they need to do their research and make sure what's on that title and do a title search because if they buy the property at that auction, those liens are gonna be attached to the property. All right, sheriff's deed. That is the type of deed that whoever purchased that property is going to receive. And remember, a sheriff's deed doesn't have any indemnification or any warranties. We talked about deeds in, in a previous video. All right, let's talk about a non-judicial foreclosure. Non-judicial foreclosure allows a foreclosure to happen by what's called a power of sale by a trustee when the borrower known as the trustor has defaulted on their payments. The key here is court action has not or is not required. And we talked about this in that previous video I discussed under um, deeds of trust. It's a video called deeds of trust that I did. I highly recommend that you watch that one as well for, for this particular part of this video. Remember in a deed of trust state, there are three parties in a relationship. Um, in a mortgage state, there are two. There's the mortgagor and the mortgagee. In a non-judicial st foreclosure state, that is a deed of trust state, there are three. There is the trust or, who's the borrower. There's the trustee and the beneficiary. And remember, we discussed in that previous video, the trust or, they transfer title to the trustee who's a disinterested third party that holds on to title, legal title, for the beneficiary who's the lender until the note is paid off, okay? So if the borrower defaults, the beneficiary who's the, uh, who's the bank is gonna notify the trustee who's holding legal, legal title to go ahead and do the foreclosure. So the trustee is gonna hold a trustee sale, all right? That's again, it, it, the sale actually happens right on the stairs of the courthouse. All right. So there are about eight things I want you to know about a non-judicial foreclosure. Number one, it's used in deed of trust states. Number two, it's a quick foreclosure. As soon as the, the lender, who's the beneficiary, notifies the trustee who has that legal title to do the trustee sale, um, it could be just a matter of, of weeks, you know, eight to 12 weeks before it's all said and done. Unlike the, the uh, for judicial foreclosure where it could take literally years. 
Number three, it allows what's called a power of sale to foreclose, and that's done by the trustee. Number four, trustee carries out the trustee sale once the beneficiary has given the proper notices to all the lien holders of record on that property. That's important. There has to be integrity in the process. So what's going to happen is the lender is going to send out, they're going to do a title search is actually what they're going to do. They're going to send out, and sometimes they hire the trustee to do this, but the, the lender is still re responsible to ensure that notice is given to all the lien holders that, hey, we're moving forward with uh, any uh, with a trustee sale. So if you have uh, an interest in the property, you might want to speak up now type deal. But once all the notices have been delivered and the notice periods have been fulfilled, and again, the notice periods can be anywhere from 30 to 90 to 120 days, that is very state specific. But once the proper notices have been given and, and uh, the, the notice periods have been seasoned, then the trustee sale can be scheduled and go on. Number five, opening bid is usually the amount that's owed to the beneficiary. Let me explain how a trustee sale happens. It's scheduled and it happens typically at the courthouse stairs. The trustee who has legal title is going to show up and they're going to be the initial bid. They're going to say, we are owed $105,000. That's the opening bid. Now, anybody and everybody can show up to the sale and they can start bidding on it. The opening bid is going to be $105,000. Um, depending on the, the property, the property may be valued at two hundred. dollars The trustee is only going to bid $105,000. Now, other people are going to bid to try to get that property. And maybe the final sale is $150,000. So the trustee gets their $105,000. And now the... A uh, person who is the successful bidder, they now own a property that's worth 200, but they only paid 150. That's how those trustee sales work. But if you're a, the successful bidder in that trustee sale, look at number eight. Those tax liens, special assessments, IRS liens, etc., they don't get removed. So anybody that's going to show up at that trustee sale needs to make sure that they search the title to see what's on there because it, that bidder, they win, they now own the property, and they're going to be responsible for paying those tax liens and special assessments. All right, number, um, number six is if the successful bidder is the trustee, the trustee, all right? So let's say that uh, no one shows up and the trustee has the opening and only bid of 105000 Then what's going to happen at that point is it's going to get sent off and be sold as a bank foreclosure. I'll do a different video on that later on down the road. Um, but the successful bidder, the person in our example that paid 150000 typically they're going to receive what's called a trustee's deed. That can vary from state to state as well, but typically that's what it's called. Uh, number seven, deed in lieu of foreclosure. This was very popular back in the mortgage crisis days, 2008, 9, 10, 11, where the foreclosure process started. The trustee was sending out the notices and they had a, a, a sale scheduled, a trustee sale scheduled. A lot of times what the bank would do is just simply say, transfer, just deed the property over to us and we're done. So that's what the borrower would do. The borrower would simply, they would sign what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure that says we voluntarily give all of our interest back to the bank or back to the trustee. That's what they did. It's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. And there was actually some incentive to do that because on people's credit reports, um, and, I, and I did a, 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 a video on short sales as well. But on your credit report, a foreclosure is the worst thing that can be there. That can actually bar you from buying property up to 10 years, depending on the lender. A deed in lieu of foreclosure is not quite as bad as a foreclosure. And a short sale is actually better than a deed in lieu of foreclosure and a foreclosure. So uh, and it's something you need to know about, at least we're familiar with. All right, so before I let you go, I understand I threw a lot of terminology at you, and I'm hoping that this, by this point you have a, a pretty good understanding and a grasp of, uh, of those terms that we've been talking about if you've been watching my previous videos. But I did mention some previous videos 
in uh, this video that I highly recommend that you watch. Here is one of them. I highly recommend that you watch. It's right here. And then number two is if you have not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Click the little circle to my left and share this with somebody that you know that may be studying as well for their real estate exam. And don't forget comments and questions down below. I'll see you in the next video.